much for coming to see you in the talk. We're going to talk to you today about managing the modern tax service. Um, so I'm Grant Bailey. I'm one of the security engineers for Temple. Uh, you're probably um, maybe more the better as Temple uh, Network Solutions. Um, or if you don't know Temple, you may know Nessus, uh, which is a product that's been around for about 20 years. Uh, a lot of security professionals use it, a lot of penetration testers use it. And we have a lot of customers who use it as well. Um, so, what I'm going to talk to you about today is um, really trying to understand how you deal with more modern assets uh, when coming to your environment. Um, so, new technologies, new solutions uh, that maybe you have to deal with, manage, um, and apply security controls to in a different way to your traditional assets uh, that you already have in the data centre. Obviously, if you um, have these more modern assets and you have to start looking at new or different technologies, it adds a lot more complexity into how you go about managing them in the first place as well. Right, so I'm sorry, do you mind talking up a little bit? Yeah, it's right here in the back. Okay, I'm turning up um, So we typically look at three main areas. So trying to help you understand where you're exposed. Um, a lot of that comes down to actually gaining proper visibility into your environment, understanding what's running in there, and then starting to build a view of what potential impact of your attack surface that has, and then how you go about dealing with it. When you start needing to deal with it, um, one of the key things is you can't do everything all at once. So you have to understand how you uh, can prioritize that, where you need to focus. Um, I always give the, you know, the example, if you've got a limited window this coming weekend where you need to patch something um, that's urgent or critical, um, what do you go and do? To say you can't do everything at once, so you need to kind of work out what's the most important thing to go fix first and kind of work through things in a, a logical order. And then uh, finally, we we'll talk about briefly how do you actually start to compare to your peers? You know, certainly in the vulnerability management space, how do you judge whether um, the process you're following is actually good or you're doing a good job? You can't always look at, um, you know, do we have fewer vulnerabilities than we had last month? Because chances are you're going to have more. Um, but which are the ones that are going to impact you the most and how good are you addressing uh, those and mitigating those within your own environments? So, in terms of where you're exposed, how do we start to look and understand what the impact is to your attack surface? So as we look at it, uh, as I mentioned, um, most people have an understanding um, and technologies in place to help them deal with their more traditional assets. Um, you know, traditional assets as well compared to maybe uh, six or seven years ago now include things like mobile estate, mobile workers, laptop users, um, devices that may or may not be on your own networks, so virtual machines or web apps that may be hosted elsewhere. Um, and as that moves more into cloud services, so um, cloud environments where you may not have the same level of network access as you would with devices in your own environment. Um, you may also not have full visibility of when assets are spun up uh, or removed from that environment uh, in the case of something like containers. Above that as well, a trend we've seen more recently is devices that maybe were never designed to be sat on the main corporate network to now on. So we're talking, you know, internet things, but uh, you know, for a lot of organisations that includes industrial control systems, uh, those sort of technologies with more driver uh, to actually have the uh, network connected. Um, one of the trends we've seen in that really is where what part of the organisation may have been responsible for as they start to touch networks and these uh, systems converge that then actually now fall under the remit of the CIO and impact you know, the wider IT department whereas maybe it was a silo part of the organisation um, where the devices may or may not have touched the networks. So I'll go through a couple of examples of those. So you know, in terms of container environments, one of the things we've seen is a significant increase in Docker adoption over the last 12, 18 months as well. Um, in 2017 alone, um, it increased by 40%. Um, if Docker increases, for those maybe aren't familiar with uh, containerized environments, um, Docker's uh, effectively the, the image library where you publish a container image to, and then you have your broker uh, technologies, uh, Kubernetes, Mesos, uh, Swarm, where you can then spin up multiple instances from those. So where you touch and understand the environment may only go as far as Docker. So how do you then look into what's running, what's running off those images? If a new vulnerability uh, is discovered, um, how do you go about remediating that when you've got live running containers using it? Um, and maybe also, um, with containerized environments, you could go and get a third-party uh, container image and drop that into your environment. 
that hasn't gone through your image validation process. It's not actually published by your Docker instance. So you may have very little control um, of understanding what vulnerabilities that might uh, bring to you and how to actually go about remediating as well. As mentioned, you know, that convergence of IT, of traditional IT, and operational technologies, so where um, SCADA systems, PLC systems, uh, are now being connected to the networks, they potentially uh, bring exposure to those networks as well. Some of these devices were never really designed to sit on a corporate network. Uh, they're not patched and updated on a weekly or monthly basis. The manufacturers aren't necessarily updating these. And in some cases, they may even uh, not be significantly updating them on a regular basis, more so than actually bringing out a replacement model. So it's a rip and replace uh, to remove vulnerabilities from some things. Um, and in some cases, uh, you know, we've got a few customers in the healthcare space where actually the, the operational technologies and um, all the devices that control them actually sit outside the remit of IT, but they're still sat within the corporate IT environment as well. So it's still um, important to understand what they are. Um, typically, as well, uh, if it's your own IT environment, you can do things like scan your own networks, you can place agents on these devices, operational technologies you probably can't. Um, you also don't want to be running uh, network scans in an environment where that could actually cause disruption to those devices. You know, certainly, you know, manufacturing, utility organisations, um, they'll measure downtime in some of those environments in the tens of thousands, up to millions uh, of pounds, dollars, or euros per hour when those systems go offline. And in terms of cloud, uh, you know, we do see a bit of a mismatch. Um, so, as you see here, this came from um, an Intel report, but a lot of organisations are now using cloud services in some way, shape, or form. You know, maybe a sales organisation has a sales force, and with the technology like that. Other organisations may have a lot of assets actually hosted by a cloud provider. Um, the prediction is that um, it's a little, it's a little odd, so it's probably more like um, nine to ten months, um, where a large amount of IT spending is actually based on cloud services and cloud technologies. The challenge is, though, a lot of organisations are still struggling to get um, good visibility and the ability to control and secure those assets. And that's causing issues, that's slowing down a lot of projects and a lot of you know, digital transformation initiatives uh, that customers are looking at. So you need to find a way of being able to embrace these new technology areas so that IT is not a inhibitor uh, to that level of change. So when you need to look at more modern assets, you know, maybe uh, with a third party cloud provider as an example, uh, it's really important to be able um, to look at an API. <coughs> to be able to understand what's going on in there, to be able to understand it. From our point of view, we typically talk about discovery. Discovery is using other technologies to help you get an understanding of those environments. So for example, um, if I use AWS, AWS, do you want to be able to look inside the environment and look at the running VMs that we currently have? Or do you actually want to look at an account number and see what's in that account inventory? What VMs do you have that currently aren't turned on? So the ones that may not have been turned on last time you did a vulnerability scan. So you don't know if they've been patched, if they've been updated because the assay is live at a particular time you scan. So for those sort of environments, there needs to be a better way of doing this. And API integrations are going that. Third party data as well. So being able to look at um, maybe an existing environment. So similar to maybe the AWS account inventory example, you might want to look at an existing CMD bill to find assets on the corporate network um, that may be uh, not currently live, uh, or in the example maybe of laptops or mobile users, being able to know that you've been able to secure them, scan them, or monitor them when they're on the actual corporate network, but that might not happen on a regular basis. Um, I'm sure we've all got users where you may have a VPN in place around those assets, but depending on what the user wants to do, they may or may not be VPN connected, so they may go uh, for a significant period of time in between being on those corporate networks and uh, being able to monitor and secure them. Um, being able to use passive capabilities, so again, kind of a bit more towards that operational technology view, um, where you can't do live scanning on networks, but you need to be able to see um, as assets come on in a non-invasive way. But also um, with transient asset types, so uh, maybe in the case of uh, containers where they have a very short shelf life in your own environment, VMs that may get some of now, or maybe where you uh, have partner organisations who at different points may have assets on the network. 
how do you, how are you able to monitor when your asset count changes? Um, and then also being able to do things like directly scan the container images. So being able to sit as part of an image validation process, so the image does not get published to be used by a broker until it's actually gone through some basic verification checks on your side. And then also, once they're actually running, being able to scan that live container environment uh, in as non-invasive way as possible, but to identify that we've just found a vulnerability in this image, you've actually got 7,000 containers live in your environment that are using that image. So you need to work out a rolling, uh, maybe remediation process to replenish those once you've actually fixed the vulnerability. At the same time, you want to, you want to make sure that no new containers are spawned from that. Uh, you want to make sure that as you're trying to fix it, the problems are actually getting worse at the same time. So with all those things, how do you now start to you know, work out where to prioritise? Um, there's a lot of information available you know, at an industry level, so probably from any of the CVD and CVS scores um, that will give you an idea of criticality. Um, but patching um, and remediating back is, is the other challenge. Um, with a lot of smart devices, so you know, how many people here have an iPhone uh, or a smartphone? How many people um, are proactive about updating or patching um, their smart devices from that point of view? Knowing full well that in 12 months' time there's going to be a new model available, and how much effort am I going to put in? I'm probably going to upgrade to that new model instead. And unfortunately, that's a, that's a very good view um, of how smart devices are being used in corporate environments as well. Particularly then, uh, you may look from a manufacturer point of view, that, that top curve, of, um, at what point do, does the, the next version of iOS only work on the last one or two models of iPhone? If you've got a model older than that, then actually you have to do a physical with and replace of that device because you're not going to be able to update it uh, and keep that device current uh, after a period of time. And we're starting to see more of that. You know, I started out in IT back in uh, you know, NT3 days and things like that, where you had a, an NT server that was running, you probably never turned it off for three years, you didn't need to update it or patch it, apart from maybe once a year with a service pack and that was kind of it. Well, that's not the case anymore. You're touching these systems on a very regular basis, the updates and, and the options around remediating them is something that's changing on a weekly basis. So I mentioned uh, having CVEs. Um, you know, depending where you sit in terms of security space, and CVEs, uh, and the CVS uh, scores, is kind of flawed, but it is the only thing we have. So it is the kind of that yardstick we measure uh, our environments by. Um, to give you an example here, uh, in 2017, there was just under 13,000 vulnerabilities given a CVE score. Uh, worryingly, there was over 20,000 vulnerabilities identified in 2017, so only two-thirds of them were given a CVE score. So when we talk about CVE, Potential being for CV unfortunately does not cover all of the vulnerabilities that you may come across in your environment. Uh, added to that, um, so CVE also gives you uh, that scoring mechanism around uh, low, medium, high, or critical vulnerabilities. Obviously, if someone says this is a critical vulnerability, uh, so to pick on a vendor, pick on Microsoft, as everyone likes to, um, Microsoft will, will tell you that there's a critical vulnerability being discovered that affects one of their applications. So they'll give you a lot of information there. But what if your critical data doesn't sit in that application? Your critical information may sit in uh, an application that's got maybe a number of medium or a couple of high uh, risk vulnerabilities. They may not be what you're focusing on first because they're not critical. Uh, and you know, if you're looking at maybe PCI or cyber essentials, you know, they drive you to focus more on uh, critical from the CPU point of view, not necessarily critical. I think the reality now is you have to have a good view of both and start to make those decisions on where you focus at. To give you an idea um, around some of that in terms of highs and criticals, what we're seeing is uh, significant deltas around um, the ability for someone to understand you have a vulnerability and have an exploit ready for it. It's typically <coughs> running ahead of your ability to assess whether your environment is impacted by that. Added to which, uh, is it easier for a potential attacker to identify targets in your environment than it is for you to match it? The answer is very typically yes. Most people have to go through change control processes before they can do things to, uh, to assets in that way. Uh, and then what happens when things get exploited? How quickly can they get exploited against how quickly can you get it? 
you know, um, think of maybe something like malware that can exploit a known vulnerability. Well, yes, you could update your signatures in the malware. They typically come after the malware is available in the marketplace. Um, but if you can actually understand that you have a vulnerability and patch the vulnerability, that's your inoculation. So you're straight away reducing the risk of actually being impacted by that malware. Um, I hope no one in the room is from the NHS, because I'm going to pick up you. Um, but WannaCry is a great example. Unfortunately, um, you know, we all understand how the NHS operates. It's a 24-7 organization. Patient data needs to be accessible constantly. Um, so the challenges they had around being able to stay as current as maybe some of the enterprise organizations um, with the updates uh, that were affected by WannaCry was very difficult. So you know, average NHS organization, probably five to six months behind the curve. Um, in terms of Microsoft updates, typical enterprise, maybe being financial in the city, uh, maybe two to three months behind. Well, the big financial had the updates in place before one quite hit, unfortunately the NHS did So we all saw the papers where various NHS organisations, or again, local press or national press, they weren't the only ones, there were many organisations impacted by one cry. Um, but some organisations who, uh, from a legislative point of view, had to be more diligent, uh, had significantly less risk in that space. So that kind of gives you some, some context around that. But if we stick some days to that, what does that actually mean? Sliding, sliding graphs is all well and good. But typically, median time for exploit uh, availability, five and a half days uh, for vulnerabilities and exploits as became available. The time to assess, 12.8 days. So give or take, you're going to be a week behind the attacker before you are able to assess your posture and start putting a plan in to remediate any of those vulnerabilities. Um, so in that sort of window, it's very easy for any new malware to potentially impact your systems uh, or any other exploit to be available. To give you an idea, um, these were um, several of the very common vulnerabilities we've seen in the last sort of uh, 12, 18 months. So, patchy struts, um, that was quite uh, quite prevalent in a number of organisations. There were quite a few breaches that were based on patchy struts. Uh, basically, they were at least three days behind any potential attacker trying to compromise their requirements. Um, going all the way down, um, multiple CPU vulnerabilities here. Um, these are uh, the Spectrum meltdown. Um, from an exploit uh, being able to be available uh, to where you could assess it, <laughs> it 15 days. Now, a lot of organizations here, uh, you may have spent a lot of time patching systems with Spectrum meltdown. Um, also, then maybe unpatching them, um, and patch is what we call, repatching them again. So, there's a lot of time and effort spent on those. To date, there's been no major uh, breach of an organization based upon Spectrum meltdown capabilities. So, why are you were busy running around trying to patch those systems? what could have been getting patched and we weren't doing because it wasn't necessarily a priority around those. So one of the key things is being able to make sure there's some good threat intelligence there. Finding out there's an exploit kit available um, on the dark web for something is great. It's also useful to know if no one's bothered to buy it. Uh, if no one's buying it, no one's likely to try and exploit you, you want to make sure you're focusing where the potential threat is actually going to be. So, um, also 34% but vulnerabilities in 2017, um, the exploit was available within 24 hours of being disclosed. I remember sitting at a, 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 a Black Hat conference uh, about two or three years ago, uh, some of the guys were up on the stage were saying, you, know, you guys are finding vulnerabilities in systems, but you know, Google have a bounty, Microsoft have a bounty, um, you know, we'll give you $50,000 if you notify us of a vulnerability. Um, but you know, the answer back from the audience was, yes, but the guy down the road who's looking to exploit it will pay it $250,000. I think the bounty now for um, a zero-day exploit um, on the iPhone has now exceeded a million dollars. So the best will in the world, someone who's found that, will be significantly more incentivized to go tell them about it instead of going to tell the vendor uh, about it as well. So you know, that's the, I think, the situation we're in today. Um, but also, you know, I say, Trying to understand some of that threat context or build some threat intelligence into what's there is how you start to make those more meaningful decisions. So just knowing that you've got those vulnerabilities, you know, the top 50 vulnerabilities, but how many of those actually affected your environment? How many of those affected assets in your environment where you have critical data? Um, they're the pieces you need to fit into the puzzle before you can make those decisions and build those remediation plans to uh, get back to a level of state. So, 
what that really means is, um, you know, and WannaCry probably a good example as well. The majority of CISOs found out about WannaCry through Facebook and LinkedIn. They didn't find out about it from the own IT teams. So when, you know, probably some of you may be in the situation where on that Friday afternoon, CISO pops his head around the door and says, hey, this WannaCry thing, how's that going to impact us? You maybe don't know. So you've just lost your weekend while you're busy messing about with the firewall, trying to find develop the Microsoft patches, work out how to implement the new environment. Um, whereas it'd be more useful to have a better handle on that, to know, actually, yes, we understand it, we, we've mitigated that already with our firewall, uh, or we have a mediation plan in place already to patch those systems, or best case scenario, we've actually already done that. From the flip side as well, you may have um, some of those environments where Yes, there's an application that's impacted. No, it's not critical. We don't have critical data there. We've done something else that was more important. This is why. So you're able to actually show that you are following the process. It is working for you, um, not necessarily just relying on stuff that's coming in the news or, or from particular vendors as well. So what that means is you need to start looking at that vulnerability prioritization. Start building those things in there. Start to have that asset content. So try and feed in from your CMDB. Now hopefully, um, I've asked this a couple of times, you know, if you want to show of hands if your CMDB is up to date and accurate, many people don't put their hands up. Um, and that's the reality of what we've got today. You know, CMDB is not a single source of truth, it's typically multiple sources of truth for you. So trying to understand what is difficult. So if you've got something like vulnerability management, you want to make sure you're validating or enhancing the information you have in your CMDB, but likewise, it's also a source of truth for the things you need to be concerned about. So how you identify if a new asset is critical to the business or not, what the application is going to be, that's probably in the CMDB and you can pull that information through as well to start making some of those decisions as well. And to that, um, being able to look at those CVSS metrics. So if you're familiar with CVSS, you may also be familiar with temporal CVSS. So that's where the score um, you know, kind of has a, a life of its own. And based on whether there's an exploit available, based on whether there's then a patch available for that exploit, it will actually change that score over time as well. So there's things like that to understand. Being able to know that there's an exploit available, if there's an exploit, um, or a patch available, sorry, uh, to fix that, that's been available maybe for 90 days plus, that's probably something that, you know, it's not necessarily a great place to be. Something that's been available that long is probably something that you should apply to your system. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that 90 days ago when the patch was picked, there was actually an exploit available. So understanding that temporal score means that um, something you may not have had to focus on now that there's an exploit available and it's being exploited might be a bit more important to be focused on as well. So being able to try to stay on top of those things. And it's that looking at the threat data. So being able to understand you know, what's happening with that exploit. If it is being exploited, is it being exploited in the vertical line? Are particular uh, types of companies, particular organisations, or particular types of applications uh, more exposed to being exploited than others? And how's that going to affect them? So, being able to feed that as well. And also being able to look at other assets uh, as well. So, you know, Tenable, uh, probably a majority of security that do, we have our own threat intelligence team. So, we'll actively be looking for vulnerability in the space. Uh, about two months ago, we actually identified a vulnerability with an IP camera. Um, which, on its own, finding the ability of a particular make of IP camera uh, may not be that significant. Uh, in this case, though, it was the manufacturer uh, whose IP cameras were OEM'd by most of the IP camera manufacturers in the uh, market as well. So it actually had a very significant impact. So being able to find those things and then understand the actual vulnerability, how does that impact me, um, and building the context around that as well, so that's something very, uh, very critical as well. So, how do you then compare to your peers? How do you understand if how you're managing this and dealing with this as a process, is that working effectively for you? And from an industry point of view, does that put you, you know, at the top, at the bottom, where do you sit? So being able to build some metrics around that to understand that starts to be very key. Um, but also, you need to be able to do that in a way that as you report up into the organisation, how do you reflect that? You know, as I mentioned earlier, just having fewer vulnerabilities um, than you had last month is unrealistic. Chances are there's more there. So you need to build that context into How many more critical vulnerabilities do I have that are going to impact my critical systems? How many high vulnerabilities do I have that might be more important 
system because they affect my critical systems, then a critical vulnerability from a non-critical system. And how do you make those decisions? So being able to have that process in place, have those metrics, those decision-making capabilities is really key to show that you're managing this and improving that management process over time. From our point of view, um, we're, we're building into our system what we refer to as a cyber exposure score. So we're able to look at a number of metrics across your environment and how you're managing this to help you build that view of whether you are actually improving your execution against that process over time. Or does the process itself need to be improved? Um, we've got an upcoming product. It's actually in beta at the moment called Lumen. Um, this is a quick screenshot from one of the screens from it. And this just gives you that view of time to assess, what you managed to remediate in that uh, period of time, and then overall to remediate the rest of the environment, how long did it take? Then we've got the same uh, one looking at it from a, an industry average point of view, and then one from population. So if you're maybe a, a finance organisation, um, am I top 10% or bottom 10%? Do I need to, am I doing okay, or do I need to invest some more time and effort into improving things? Um, that's my industry average, but actually, how do I look maybe compared to the UK? Where do I sit from that point of view? And that could be your population measure as well. So you get, get that view of, you know, I may not be as good as some of my peers, um, but actually I'm better than the wider organisations, maybe the wider vertical that I sit in. So um, I, I mentioned it a couple of times, um, cyber exposure. For us, cyber exposure is that delta between your ability to manage, monitor, and control your environment from the traditional uh, asset point of view uh, to also extending that to the, uh, the more modern assets, so those you know, ICS systems, uh, the containerized environments, that sort of thing. And how do you bring those into a single view and understand what that delta is and what the impact of that delta is to yourself? So that's it. Conscious time between you guys and lunch. Um, we're actually, we've got a stand downstairs, stand 19, uh, with one of our partners, uh, Sapphire. So if you've got any questions, uh, obviously I'm available now. If you want to go up lunch first, we'll all be available down at the stand uh, downstairs as well.